Considering surgery for your eyes, whether it's for medical or cosmetic reasons, can be really intimidating. Today we are going to speak with oculoplastic surgeon Dr. Tanya Perich about different surgical procedures for the eyes, what the protocols are for different surgeries, and the importance of addressing dry eye. Dr. Perich? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking with Dr. Tanya Perich of the Perich Eye Center in Tampa, Florida. So Dr. Perich, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. So Dr. Perich, you work in, uh, in ocular plastics, and I think that's something that maybe not a lot of people are familiar with. So can you explain to me what is ocular plastics? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm Dr. Perich. I am a board certified ophthalmologist and ocular plastic surgeon. So I, in my residency, uh, performed all forms of eye surgery, uh, including comprehensive ophthalmology, cataract surgery is my primary focus, as well ocular plastics, which is sort of facial plastic surgery around the eyes. So specifically things like eyelid lifts, also known as blepharoplasty, uh, brow lifts, so we do upper lids, lower lids. Uh, some of those things are medical because the eyelid is hanging down and the patient can't see, or they have hooding coming in from the sides, making it a blinder effect so that they can't see when their peripheral vision when they're driving. Uh, there are also things that are cosmetic, like the bags underneath the eyes, or even just a cosmetic blepharoplasty for someone who's starting to get a little bit of that hooding, but it doesn't quite qualify for medical insurance coverage. You know, it's, it's interesting that you could say that because I think a lot of times when people hear of plastic surgery in general, they think that it's 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 almost all cosmetic. Uh, and and uh, what would you say the split is between cosmetic and, and medical uh, plastics that you're doing? Actually, I'd say uh, at least seventy five percent of my cases that I do are medical and covered by insurance. Uh, we have a, a large population of seniors here in Florida, um, and Tampa Bay is growing every year. So. Lots and lots of patients that have what's called functional um, uh, problems with their eyes uh, versus the cosmetic, which is, uh, and a lot of times, a lot of my patients will do a medical eyelid lift or medical blepharoplasty, and we'll do cosmetic add-ons where we'll add in the lower lids, which is always cosmetic, unless, um, unless it's an ectropion or an entropion, which is a dysfunction of the eyelid rolling in or rolling out. Um, and therefore the eye can have really grave problems with dryness and completely damaging the eye uh, drying out because the eyelid's not functioning correctly. So quite a number of things. Very good. So we've talked a little bit about a lot of the different procedures that, that, that you work through in your practice, but walk me through what, generally speaking, obviously, what, what do these procedures look like? So what, are, what is the downtime? Uh, what does the process look like? How does that work? Uh, so most important, patients come to me for an initial consult. We discuss what their needs are, whether it's purely medical or if they'd like to do some cosmetic add-ons or if the entire case is completely cosmetic. Based on their needs, their desires, their desired outcomes, whether they want to add on you know, CO2 laser resurfacing and, and all of the different options that they have. So let's just take someone who would need a basic upper lid eyelid lift, upper blepharoplasty, and say it's medical. Uh, that patient would need to have cardiac clearance, so make sure their heart and lungs are healthy enough to have surgery because it is a actual surgery. Um, they have to go to the primary care doctor, you know, make sure heart and lungs are good. And then we have to have them make sure they're off of all blood thinners for at least two weeks and no alcohol, no ibuprofen, aspirin, things like that, no vitamins or fish oil. So we don't just say, okay, hi, we just met today let's do surgery tomorrow. So there is proper surgical planning. Uh, in terms of having insurance involved, we have to submit all of those documents to their insurance, make sure it's covered and appropriate because there have been a lot of cases in the past of fraudulent people doing these surgeries when they weren't medically necessary. And so we always wanna make sure that we have it covered by their insurance before going forward. But basically they come in day of procedure, uh, no breakfast, they come in that morning and um, I mark their eyelids, prepare them for surgery, take them into the operating room, numb their eyelids. And actually even before that, um, in the pre-op setting, 
we always clean their eyelids with our OcuSoft products, the eyelid scrubs specifically to get off all the excess skin oils. Otherwise my surgical marking pen does not stick to the oils, doesn't stick to their face. So we start with that. And um, once we're in the OR, because the most important part is pre-marking the patient, deciding if their eye is still going to close. That, you know, no matter what you're doing, if it's functional or cosmetic, you always want to assure the patient is going to have a functional eyelid after the procedure. And that's why it's so important to select a board certified qualified surgeon who does specifically this type of procedure as their specialty. Um, Cause God forbid you do a, a procedure and it's deforming and causing dysfunction. So anyway, uh, I use a CO2 laser to do all of my upper lid blepharoplasties and all of my other surgical procedures on the face as well. So the laser cuts and coagulates at the same time leaving the patient with minimal bruising, bruising and bleeding afterwards. So they heal a lot faster. Uh, the incisions are sharp, beautiful, great healing. I do use uh, sutures that have to be taken out 10 days after the surgery. The reason you don't want to use dissolvable sutures to close your incisions is that the eyelid is the thinnest skin in the body. And that skin is commonly associated with having scar tissue formation. If there's something left in it that's a foreign body, it says out, 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 and create scar tissue, get it out. So we don't want to have those nodules created as scar tissue. So leave-in stitches are uh, less desirable. But patients can return to their normal activities a few weeks after their procedure, and that's about it. So I, I would imagine that uh, when, when we're messing around or around the eye area in any shape, way, or form, that there's always the chance that, uh, that there are some other things that can come along with it. And I, I, I would imagine that there may be some instances of, of dry eye that can come from this, a temporary, uh, hopefully. Uh, but walk me through that. So after we get done with the surgery, what are some of the things I can expect uh, as a post-surgical uh, regimen to go through? So in any of my post-surgical patients, whether it's for cataract or blepharoplasty, we always recommend that they use preservative-free artificial tears. I prefer the Retain MGD tears as a nice preservative-free option because it does mimic the natural tear uh, like four times a day. <clears throat> because when you have an incision in the eye, uh, for example, for cataract surgery or any other intraocular surgery, those incisions feel like the patient has sand in their eye. So for the next few weeks, they think there's something in their eye when in fact, it's actually the eyelid blinking over the incision. In concept with the eyelid surgery, we do put a metal shield in their eyes to protect their eyes from the laser during the procedure itself. So, you know, sometimes if there was, um, if the shield were to move, you could have a corneal scratch, but that's very, very rare. Most patients just experience dryness just as a result of the local inflammation around the eyes post-surgically. For example, uh, when I numb the eyes, I do an injection of lidocaine across the entire eyelid, and that's going to elevate the eyelid away from the eyeball. And when you don't have, it could be just because of pure volume expansion of the eyelid, right? So within 48 hours, those fluids go out and everything's back to normal. But for the first few days, you definitely have to lubricate the eyes aggressively because you don't have that good approximation between the eyelid and the eyeball. And in order to have a lubricated eyeball, it needs that smooth eyelid continuously blinking over its surface all the time. Now, we're talking a little bit about dry eye here. And, uh, and I know that uh, ocular plastics is not the only thing you've done. We, we talk, well, you do rather. Uh, we talk about, uh, we've talked about cataract surgeries, other things. So are you treating um, dry eye or, uh, or uh, other uh, problems in your uh, practice as well? Oh, all the time. Dry eye is probably one of the primary things that we treat, uh, both in patients on a routine basis, whether it's all the time. Um, aging population does have hormonal changes, so they do have issues with producing a lot of the, you know, all of these glands around the eyes are hormone sensitive, as well as if you're dehydrated. Uh, seasonally, we definitely have patients that come in the spring and fall with different seasonal allergies, and we have to address that as part of their dry eye, as well as pre- uh, surgical management for cataract patients. We know that dry eye does affect the cornea shape, which then affects the lens that we choose, the lens measurements that we choose to put in the patient's eye for cataract surgery to give them the best targeted vision. So lots to think about in dry eye. 
Absolutely. So do you have a specific regimen that you go through with uh, dry eye? Is, is, is every patient different? Uh, walk me through the steps of how you're uh, diagnosing and treating dry eye. So it really depends on the cause of their dry eye, right? For some patients, it's polypharmacy. They're on tons of medications that contribute to dry eyes. What of those medications can we stop? Um, if you're on those medications and you have to stay on them, then it looks like we're definitely going another route. But for most patients, I always put them on aggressive preservative-free tiers at least you know, two to four times a day, depending on their initial start. We might start them on some steroid eye drops to reduce inflammation because we do know that dry eye is an inflammatory condition. So that local inflammation on the surface of the eye causes that chronic condition um, and activation of the immune system locally. Some patients have ocular allergies, so we have to consider using eyelid scrubs to clean those allergens off of their eyelids. And OcuSoft does make a wonderful product that is geared towards patients with allergies. It has some calming herbs in it that you can leave on with a formula for that one. Uh, rinsing their eyes after they've been out outside with those allergens or using antihistamine eye drops, but in moderation because antihistamines also can dry your eyes out. Other causes of dry eye, such as oil gland dysfunction, patients need to be put on omega-3s or increase their high quality fish consumption or flaxseed oil in their diet. So we talk a lot about nutrition with patients, as well as adding in uh, the oil-based tiers like the MGD retained tiers uh, to mimic that tear film. And oftentimes the patients will have clogging of their eyelash glands and that's where the oils do come from, right around the eyes. We don't think about having glands, oil glands, around the eyes and that oil actually goes from the surface of the eye, or I'm sorry, from the edge of the eyelid onto the surface of the eye to help lubricate the eyeball. For patients like myself, I'm wearing makeup right now. I use the OcuSoft eyelid scrubs to take off my makeup. That way I make sure that those glands are not getting clogged. So the next day my eyes aren't dry as a result of having had mascara or eyeliner on. Uh, some other patients have Demodex, which is a mite that sounds gross, but a little, some, sometimes you can have staph, um, so bacteria infection in the eyelashes, which contributes to styes. Other patients have the Demodex, which is the mites that lives in the eyelash glands, and that needs to be treated with a product like Oust, which has the tea tree oil in it for actually eradicating uh, these organisms that are stealing your oils and making your eyes dry. That is very interesting. Well, Dr. Perich, we have covered a lot of topics today, and I really appreciate you being with us. I'm, I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about ocular plastics, about dry eye in general, and, and all of the things that the Perich Eye Center can provide. So thank you very much for being with us. Is there anything that, that you want to leave our viewers with before we part ways? Um, well, just you can check out our Instagram page, Perich Aesthetics, um, also Perich Eye Center on Instagram as well. Uh, both of those, parachai.com and parachesthetics.com. Check out our work. Come on in. Give us a call. Uh, we're here to help and ask any questions you might have.